Hey everyone, this is George from DinosaurGeorge.com answering the questions I get from around the world. Item today is item number 3724. This thing is pretty wicked. This is a Tyrannosaurus Rex tooth with the root. You know, oftentimes we see, and this is a replica of course, we see replicas where oftentimes it's just the end, just the, the part that you would see extended from the jaw. But this one has the root, which really shows you the sheer size and shape of the same. What's really cool about it is this is a, uh, an incredibly thick tooth, which is common for Tyrannosaurus rex. These guys would have been probably possessed the ability to crack through bone, to bite through bone. And when, when people get these, oftentimes they're amazed that they're not sharp. There's a reason for that, and that is really sharp teeth oftentimes lack stability. The tip is a very weak spot, and if you are cracking into bone, you'll break the tip of the tooth off. So these guys' teeth are more rounded. Now they have serrated edges, and this replica has a good example of the two serrated edges on the side of their tooth. So this is a good item. You can find it on my catalog, and you can find a ton of stuff. So if you go there, I hope that you enjoy it. All right, let's get into it. Um, Jose from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. Hey there, DG. Hey, Jose, it's nice to hear from you. I've always wondered about my favorite dino, Achillobator's weird pelvis with that huge pubic boot. Huge for a dromaeosaur. The pubic boot for some of you is the, the bone that kind of sort of looks like an anvil almost that extends down between the legs, uh, usually facing sort of forward. It's a, it's a cool looking thing. What do you think it was for? Was it for balance while running? Maybe to anchor bigger leg muscles? Maybe it's not even his and it's some other species of bones that got washed up or mixed into it somehow, as some people think. Thank you, for, uh, thank you much for your time. Have a great day. Thank you, Jose. Thank you for taking the time to write me. Okay, uh, Achillobator is a large dromaeosaur, a rivaled Utah raptor in size. It's a big one, but it's very sketchy as far as known. There's not a lot known about it. What Jose is saying is some people have even suggested that that particular bone may not have even belonged to that dinosaur. That when it died, it may have died during a flood, for instance, and a lot of dinosaurs can be washed down in the same general area and get stuck in a bend in a river, and sometimes bones intermix and it can be a little confusing. But, um, you know, somebody proposed once, and I was pretty impressed with this, that dinosaurs, theropods may have been able to sort of rest on that pubic boot the way a kangaroo leans back and rests on his tail. That maybe by splaying their legs and squatting down, they sat on it, and since it's curved, maybe it even act like a rocking chair, who knows? <laughs> but. I've never seen the skeletal drawings of it, so I can't speak to this, Jose, because I don't know if it's larger than average, if it was larger than what would be expected for that, or if it's large simply because a kilobator may have been a large dinosaur. Not large, and I'm, I'm talking about Utah raptor size, not giant. It's a great question, Jose, and I wish I knew the answer to it, but that's really cool, and I like him too. I think he's a cool dinosaur. All right, David from Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. David says, if you could choose the new big bad dinosaur of a Jurassic World movie, who would you choose? Oh, David, what a cool question. Man, gosh, I wish I could, I wish I knew. I mean, you can't get much better than T-Rex as far as the big bad dudes. But uh, man, what about E. Pantereus or Sorophaganax? They may, may be the same animal. Uh, you know who I'd like to see, though, in all honesty? I would like to see something like Rajasaurus or... Um, one of the more rare but big, rough-looking dudes. Um, there was another one. I can't remember his name. Boy, he is considered to be one of the ugliest. Not, it's not uh, Majungatholus or Majungasaurus. It's not that guy. It's some other dude that has all these bumps all over his face. And boy, it escapes me right now. I can't remember his name. Some of you will know I know, and you'll post it. So if you do, thank you in advance. But I think he would be cool simply because he would look wicked. And I sometimes, in movies, I like the looks of things. I think that's kind of cool. All right. Uh, thank you, David, for writing me, by the way. Okay, Zach, the St Steel City Tiger, my little brother from Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Dear George, first off, how are you doing, big bro? Well, Zach, I feel like your big brother, even though you're seven feet taller than I am, <laughs> but I still feel maybe older brother is a better way to put it. But I love you like a brother, Zach. Hope everything is good. It is, Zach, and I hope you and your family are doing well as well. I have two questions for you. First off, how do paleontologists estimate how fast an animal could be just by the bones? Second, how well do you think a pack of animals like wolves or lions would do in the time of dinosaurs? Your friend, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, wait, He's not Bruce Dickinson. Uh, your friend Zach. Zach, one of my one of my 
favorite, one of my worst mistakes I ever made. I owned a bass guitar autographed by everybody from Iron Maiden and I sold it when I was desperate for money and I regret that terribly. So the rhyme in the ancient mariner, I know exactly who you're talking about. And no, you're not Bruce Dickinson. All right, uh, your first question about speed. You know, there are formulas that can be used based on modern animals where you measure the length of the upper leg bone and the lower leg bone, and you can estimate stride length. You can also do it with tracks, and that's what, that's what paleontologists often use as footprints. There are formulas that relate to modern animals. And if they work with modern animals, then those formulas can be applied to prehistoric animals and probably be very accurate or close to as accurate as we can be. So they can do it by using math as a way to estimate speed by looking at the length of the femur and the tibia and the fibula and then calculating stride length and other things. But it's actually fairly, I consider it to be a, a pretty solid way to do things, Zach. Your second question, how would a, a wolves or lions do in the age of dinosaurs? You know, there would be advantages to having those bigger mammalian brains, that's for certain. And maybe they would hold their own, even against something like raptors, because the reason why mammals right now rule the planet is because of the larger brain capacity and the ability to learn and the ability to uh, sort of calculate what to do. I'm not saying dinosaurs didn't possess that, but I'm saying that mammals have a greater advantage when it comes to that. So I think they would have done great. But that's a cool question, buddy. Say hey to your parents for me, by the way, Zach. Okay, my friend Alex from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. You know, Alex, I remember last year I commented, I'm going to be up in Canada for anybody that wants to come see me, but I didn't say where. <laughs> That's like people telling me, hey, we're going to be in Texas and not say where. Canada is a big place. <laughs> so, so uh, again, in my previous email, I told everybody, I think around August the 15th of this year, this is 2014, uh, I will be speaking at Jurassic Forest, which is a really cool place to come see robotic dinosaurs in an environment that looks real. I'll be up there, and that's uh, in Gibbons, which is right outside of Edmonton. Okay, so Alex, for you, uh, do you think it's true that the earliest dinosaurs had feathers? Alex, great question. I don't know where feathers come along. I mean, clearly they're in the Jurassic because we see that with Archaeopteryx. Were there feathers prior to that? I don't know. You know, when you look at the skeletal design of Archaeopteryx and you compare it to, let's say, um, Eoraptor, they're not dramatically different. And so it doesn't look like they went through these dramatic changes from the earliest up until the ones that had feathers. So there's a good possibility that they had feathers at that time and perhaps feathers evolved earlier on. I just don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know if the weather environments were dramatically different and that feathers may have been a way to help insulate with this change in the climate from the earliest to, the, to when we know feathers appeared? I just don't know, Alex. That's a brilliant question. To my knowledge, there's never been any absolute proof that there is, but um, if so, I hope you guys can correct me. All right, David from Norwood, Norwood, Pennsylvania. Dear George Blessing, hey David, call me DG, call me George, call me what you want, but I, well, don't call me what you want because I may not be good, but, <laughs> but uh, feel free to call me on my, by my first name, Dave, but I appreciate your courtesy. I have two questions asked, and then I'll stop and let others have their chance. That's very cool of you, David. Thank you, man. What's your opinion on Triceratops and Taurosaurus being same or different? Um, I'm of the opinion that they're completely different dinosaurs that do have a relationship, obviously. But I think this notion of trying to make things fit doesn't make any sense. Animals, there are animals that morph through their life, but most of them are not the higher life forms. Most of them are, are fish or insects that completely change, and amphibians. Well, they'll completely morph into something that looks different. That's not very common in higher life forms, and at the time, I mean, dinosaurs are certainly a higher life form. They evolved to be pretty incredible animals. I don't think it makes sense that at one point in an animal's life, it just completely changes to something else. I, I don't think that's a realistic thing. Now, I applaud the paleontologist who proposed it because I think it's great to start conversation, but I just don't agree with that. I don't think it's the truth. And most importantly, when you're young, your energy is being spent trying to grow. And to suddenly apply even greater amounts of energy just to morph your head into something different does not make any sense at all to me. Um, I don't think that's the case. Now, certainly animals like deer, as they mature, they grow larger horns. Moose grow larger antlers. Uh, orangutans grow this big, huge, fleshy thing on their face. 
But the point is that those are appendages that are growing. Those are not the actual skull that's transforming into something different. So therefore, I do not believe that that's what they did. I, I, don't, I don't believe it. Uh, and you mentioned that. I, you said uh, you just can't accept the idea that Triceratops and Torvosaurus were the same animal. It seems illogical for a vertebrate to have a solid frill used for potential defense and then pierce it for display purposes only. See, I agree with that. I don't think it makes any sense to have that big frill if it indeed was used for a weapon and then you take away half the weapon or defensive weapon. It, does, it's, it would be like you're going into combat with a shield to defend yourself. But when you turn 35, you cut two big holes in the shield. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. And I, so I, I agree with you. I don't believe it's the case. Uh, and let's see, your second question was, um, 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 uh, how could dinosaurs survive natural disasters such as hailstorms, lightning, and tornadoes? Ooh, do I like this question. Size can't always be used to protect them against the elements. Thank you for your time, and I hope others get a chance to have their questions answered. I'm still working on my novel, by the way. Good for you, and I want to know what's going on with it. P.S. I don't blame you for telling the same idea about Pachycephalosaurus necking each other like giraffes in your 152nd video. Great minds think alike. Thank you, brother. For those of you that, that don't know what he's talking about, I propose that I thought that, that Pachycephalosaurus didn't run and ram into each other. I think they stood side by side and swung their necks into the, swung their heads into the sides of each other, much like a giraffe. It's simply a proposal that I had, uh, or a hypothesis. Now, back to this question. This is brilliant, man. What did they do? What, what happened when a tornado came? What happened when lightning struck? How did they deal with hail? I don't know, man. I mean, animals today survive it. They, they, I guess it's because they get an advance notice because they're much more attuned to the environment. And I think they have enough notice to get out of the way and find locations where they could hide under trees, uh, uh, in caves, any pl an overhang on the backside of a mountain range. There's, there's no way to know for certain how they handled it, but they must have, they absolutely had to because there were big dramatic uh, environmental changes happening, which causes a lot of hurricanes and tornadoes and that sort of stuff. Great questions, man. Good luck on your, your, uh, uh, your novel. All right, John from Austin, Texas. I've recently read that all dinosaurs had feathers. Is this true? All of them? Well, John, I agree with you. I have the same skepticism you do. I do not believe that it's been proven yet that all do. Clearly there were feathered dinosaurs, and clearly these dinosaurs have relationships with one another. But that doesn't mean they all have to have the same features. Let's take fish. All fish evolved from a common ancestor. Some evolved scales, some did not. That's a perfect example of we can't just simply lump everything into one group and say fish have scales, the end. That's not true. So I don't believe that's the case with dinosaurs. But again, keep in mind, I said this in an earlier video, it may not necessarily, now there was a couple of paleontologists that proposed it and I get that, but sometimes what they propose gets taken out of context and gets expanded on greatly by the media in an effort to make a more dynamic story. So uh, I would be hesitant to think that all paleontologists agree with that notion. In fact, my guess would be most of them are cautious because most paleontologists are very thorough, cautious people who really look deeply in the facts before they make a, a, a uh, before they, they announce their hypothesis to the community. Finally, Karen from Houston, Texas. I heard now that they think Triceratops was just a teenage form of another dinosaur. Is that true? Karen, it's funny you mentioned that because that's the question I just answered for, who was I talking to? I was talking to David. That's the same question. And yeah, I don't agree with that, uh, Karen. I don't think that's the case. I think that um, sometimes things are said or sometimes they're expanded upon in an effort to draw attention rather than to get to the, the facts. Now, I don't have access to the same information that, uh, that some of the folks that agree with this have, so I can't say that they're wrong. Uh, I just have a different opinion, and my opinion is based on looking at modern animals as a template for prehistoric animals, because modern animals are a window into the past, and they give us clues as to what's going on. And from what I can tell, I just cannot believe that that animal would morph into something different. All right, if you have a question, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Click on the Ask Dinosaur George page. While you're on my website, visit my catalog. If you want a really cool replica like this, they are available to you. We ship pretty quick. Um, remember, for you young people, practice your reading. For everybody out there, uh, use your good manners and I hope you guys are doing well and I will try my best to shoot more of these as time allows. See ya.